So well, welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Shinichi Nakagawa, who um, is visiting us in the framework of the theoretical science visiting program. Professor uh, Shinichi is a professor at the University of uh, Southern Wales in uh, Sydney, right? Yeah. And uh, where he leads the Interdisciplinary Ecology and Evolution Lab. Mm -hmm. And his main expertise is in uh, meta-analysis, so the science of uh, answering questions by combining a large number of different uh, experimental studies. One of the course of his activity has been uh, to use this technique in behavioral ecology, but then uh, his actually his productivity is rather impressive, so he branched off in a very vast uh, number of directions, and he will tell us a bit about this work today. So Shinichi, it's a pleasure to have you. And yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Simone. And um, yeah, what a sort of privilege to be here and uh, what a wonderful place you have. And, uh, you know, I'm actually, I'm Japanese originally from, uh, actually, I was born in Nagano. And, uh, you know, this is sort of my image of paradise. You can see the coral reef and you can work as much as we want. And this is wonderful. Uh, so we're going to tell you about like meta research and meta analysis in ecology and evolution. It's the vast topic, but see how I go. First, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my group members in Sydney. They're probably missing me by now. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, our funding source, ARC. So for, there's two parts to this uh, talk. First, are we in a reproducibility or replication crisis in ecology and evolution? So what is reproducibility or replication crisis? I use these terms interchangeably in this talk. And the first time I heard this term, reproducibility crisis, was in this paper in Nature uh, back in 2000, about 10 years ago. And it said, they're trying to replicate a cancer landmark study, 53 of them, 90% of them, they couldn't replicate. You're not talking about behavioral ecology studies or anything like the cancer landmark study. And this is pretty shocking, isn't it? And after one year later, psychologists actually tried to replicate 100 key experimental study in their field, and 68 of them didn't replicate. Okay, so that's what they sort of like this paper made, this paper in science made, I guess, the reproducibility crisis or replication crisis very famous. And uh, if everything replicates, this is the uh, original and the replicated study, hundreds, hundreds of studies there, they should all rely on this one-to-one -one line. But as you see, lots of them effect size much smaller and two-thirds didn't replicate, yeah? So, uh, you know, Psychology is certainly in the replication crisis. So after a few years later, there was a survey in Nature. They asked this, you know, 1,600 scientists across different disciplines, asked, are we in a crisis? Okay, this is the answer. 52 of them said, yes, we're in a crisis. You know, we need to do something about it. And the 38 says, oh, we are in a slight crisis, whatever that means. So all together, it's quite serious. 90% of us are thinking like, oh, we are in a crisis. We've got to do something about it. Me personally is interested in this question that are we in a replication crisis in ecology and evolution? Actually, we saw this uh, replica large replication effort by different labs in psychology. This was done in economics and also computer sciences, and they produce similar sort of results. Some are more better than others, but you know, lots of results didn't replicate. And uh, the reason, you know, we are yet to do such large effort replication study in ecology and evolution, but we have a very good reason we haven't done so. Eh? We deal with, in ecology, we deal with those, like how many species, uh, nearly 9 million species in the world, and we deal with diversity of species or all the biodiversity. Like, for example, my colleagues study Seychelles warblers in Seychelles. How are we going to replicate that? You know, that's not that going to be easy. However, multiple lines of evidence suggest we are probably in replication crisis in ecology and evolution. So, 
first line of evidence. I've done the survey with my colleague uh, now several years ago. Maybe how many of you have heard of questionable research practices? Maybe, no? So questionable research practices is what it sounds like. So it's actually selective reporting. You're not reporting everything, just reporting a significant result. P-hacking, many of you probably heard, you're throwing in the interaction, all sorts of things till you get less than 0 0.05. Hypothesizing after results are known, probably many of you have done this. You know, you had an original hypothesis, but you saw the result, we swapped the result, a hypothesis around. And also more serious note, it's a fraud, making up data. So we actually did a survey, nearly 800 ecologists and evolutional biologists together, 64% of them said they have engaged in one of those questionable research practices. Yeah, that's pretty, like it's a majority of us has engaged in one of those. And we have to, like I was told this was okay when I was a student selective reporting, and that's very, very common. What would you guess? So we included this, what percentage of people have made up data? How many, any guess on what percentage? It's 3%. That's pretty, like 24 people actually said, like those are like, I guess, what I call honest people. So real percentage would be like a triple. So like that's, that's kind of like a very scary 10%, you know, one in 10 of us maybe have, you know, made up uh, data. And uh, maybe you're thinking like, you know, maybe there's a mathematician or physicist in this crowd and they're thinking like nothing to do with us. Actually, fraud happens all the time in any single discipline, like mathematics, for example, they make proof so difficult, nobody can understand. And the reviewers are too proud to say they don't understand that they get published. So you can like cheat all the time, right? So we, you know, there's a systemic problem in ecology and evolution and all other fields. And another evidence from ecology and evolution, my um, colleague and pizza cleaners group from Croatia, they actually did sort of a meta, meta analysis of the putting all together the 10,000 studies to quantify what proportion of studies in ecology is being wasted. So they estimate about half of studies are never published, 67 of them are poorly planned, and 41 of this is selective reporting, isn't it? 40% of them are selective reporting. So their estimate is shocking. Optimistic, uh, optimistic estimate is we are wasting 82%, and the worst estimate is 89%. So like, I'm not sort of here to say like, well, science is so bad, you know, this is hopeless, but actually science is good and that's the best we have, but we can actually do much better. Interestingly, this came out in uh, Nature, Ecology and Evolution last year. Just about 10 years ago, they'd done exactly the same sort of stuff in um, medicine. And their estimate was 85%. So it's very similar. And I think it's very common across different fields. Anyway, so those are lines of evidence. Maybe we're in a replication crisis. And this is where our study comes in. So providing more evidence, I guess. Our question was that what's the impact on publication bias? I assume everybody knows publication bias. So people trying to publish just positive results. Eh? What's the consequence of that on a knowledge about effect size, statistical power, type M and type S error. Probably I need to explain what type um, M and type S errors are. You probably all know type one and type two error. That's a false positive and false negative. Type M error is once, if you get statistically significant results, what is the, you know, what's the mistake or what, uh, uh, how much that's farther away in terms of magnitude from true effect. You know, that's a magnitude error. And type S is a bit easier. Type S, once you get significant result, what's the probability percentage of you getting uh, signs wrong? That's quite serious, isn't it? You said that we found the positive effect, but it's actually your uh, true effect should be negative, okay? So the, maybe you're not familiar with type M, type S, I think it's okay. So it's a magnitude error 
and the sign error. Okay, we quantified those, but to do this, we needed like a two, so to do the power analysis or estimating those publication bias, we need to know the true effects of phenomena, yeah? How do we do that? The best way we can think of, and uh, you know, people in other fields have done this, is like get all the meta-analysis and see the meta-analytic mean, overall mean of meta-analysis to be, take this as a surrogate of true effects. So to do that, we need a lot of meta-analysis. Yeah, we need more than 100 meta-analysis um, if we want to do this kind of big meta-meta-analysis, uh, so to say. But we are lucky because we have, a um, couple of years ago, we actually created this Prisma Equable that the pre preferred reporting item system reviews and meta-analysis ecology and evolution. So that this is a reporting guide for if you do meta-analysis and ecology and evolution, this is how you report it. Through this paper, we actually reviewed 100 meta-analysis in ecology and evolution to see the reporting quality. Have you heard of Prisma? So original Prisma was published in the, so this is a preferred, so the reporting guidelines published in the medicine. And this was, it was published 2008. And it's now I just checked the Google Scholar, it's cited 150,000 times. So that's one of the most cited guidelines of meta-analysis, because meta-analysis in medicine is serious, right? Because if you go to GP, what they are referring to is a meta-analysis those you know, uh, medical people conduct, what's the latest evidence. So through this paper, we, were, uh, we actually had nearly 100 meta-analysis reviews, so we used that uh, meta-analysis mean as our true effects of phenomena. Anyway, so around that 100 papers, 87 of meta-analysis are usable, and they have different kinds of effect size. Maybe some of you are not familiar, those standards mean difference. They're comparing the control and the experimental studies. They use those standardized version of mean difference, or sometimes they use uh, comparing, this is a ratio of two means log response ratio, and zeta is just the transformation to correlation, those are effect, you know, relationship between two uh, variables, yeah? So those standardized effect size they use in ecology and evolution because, you know, different studies use different units, so you need to standardize to put them all together. That's what meta-analysis does. And these meta-analysis, meta, so those are 87 meta-analysis, they all came with all the data set, so I had those, uh, we had basically those estimate of effect size, standard error from like thousands of studies, yeah. The question we're asking is, what's the impact of publication bias on effect size and all those statistical parameters I mentioned? Uh, to, so we needed to, just the background, sorry. We needed to actually quantify publication bias we needed to do the method. So we, a couple of years ago, we reviewed how to correct uh, publication bias, or how to detect publication bias, which we published in there. It's a review article, but it actually has a new method to quantify how much publication bias particular meta-analysis has, okay? So we use that method, and that's the result. So blue is the original effect size, and yellow is a bias corrected. So impact of publication bias and the effect size. So you remember we started off with 87 um, uh, meta-analysis, all those. Uh, once we correct for publication bias, there's a 23% reduction in overall effect size. So those are the original overall effect size from 87 studies. They're all going down, yeah? After correcting publication bias. More serious note, so, Actually, 87 meta-analysis, originally uh, 37 of them are not significant, so not different from zero. But the 50 meta-analysis, which had a significant result, 33 uh, out of 50 of them changed sign to non-significant. So that's like, we have like this vast knowledge from uh, meta-analysis, usually meta-analysis taken as the last word or overall evidence, and a lot of them, they don't collect for publication bias, actually. And once you do, we lose the sort of confidence in more than two-thirds of it. 
So what's the effects of publication bias on the statistical power? I mean, you probably know the statistical power is whether you have enough sample size or power to detect uh, true effect. Yeah? If there, there is an effect exists, what the percentage you can detect that effect. So average power, so if you take the random sample of uh, ecological paper, on average, they only have 23% of power. So that's pretty bad there, yeah? because if there's effect, you are just getting like less, you know, less than coin flip. You know, it's better you do in a coin flip. But it even gets worse after bias collection. It's only 15% uh, on average power. And uh, type M error, so if you get significant result, those paper you have, they're overestimating the effect, through effects by nearly three times. Once after collection, you know, publication bias correction, it's 4.4 pass that times, so it gets even worse. And the same sort of story with type S. Type S is like, you know, what's the probability of getting signs wrong? That's 5% is not that a lot, but once you, after bias correction, so what's published, if they say, you know, results significant, it's a positive effect, one in 10 times, maybe it's a negative result. So all those are quite serious. You know, they're based on a quite a few studies. So what is solution? So I told you all the bad news, but there's some good news to sort of how to remedy this kind of a situation, you know, how to reduce publication bias. People think I'm crazy, but you know, the pub, you know, if you publish everything, that's clearly fix the publication bias. And I'm not kind of saying like, uh, just uh, randomly publish stuff. But my guesstimate of the, you know, the truly published thesis chapter is about 50%. So if everybody puts their thesis chapter to the preprint server, like bioarchive, archive, and my colleague and I created Echoive archive. So some people kind of say like, oh, we have bioarchive. Why do we need Echoive archive? Because Echoive archive, uh, we wanted to raise the awareness of preprints, so everybody use preprints. Uh, then, you know, even you don't publish, you know, not accepting journal, it, it stays our knowledge, scientific knowledge, preventing a publication bias. And also, like Echoib Archive, we started three years ago. Now we have a near over 1,000 preprints, and the monthly access is 25,000. So that's not bad, eh? That's great for the community, you know, uh, increasing knowledge. Another um, solution I talk about is the registered reports. How many of you heard of registered reports? Okay, one, two, yeah, a few. And this is a cool way of, it's actually last, last month or last week, Nature even started to accepting a, a registered report. How it happens is usually you get reviewed once you start, you know, finish study and you know, write it up, you get reviewed here. But the registered report, you actually review that um, writing intro and method, you get reviewed. And you get the comments, you improve, and you actually do the studies, and you get like, you know, stage two reviews quite lighter because they only review, making sure it's not, they're not assessing, you know, the results are exciting or statistically significant. They're assessing whether you actually did what you promised to do. And the statistics are like actually uh, telling. So the, um, they compared. So this is a registered report, not to be confused with actually pre-registration or registration, but they are they're related. But the interesting thing is, so normal publication, this is a data from psychology, 90% of papers support their hypothesis. So 90% of paper creates positive results, yeah? You're kind of even thinking you don't even need to do study, you know, because 90% you, your hypothesis, right? What, what, what's the point of doing a, your study? Yes. But the registered report, that drops to 40%. So this really changed the way we do science, and it's actually negative results are published. Problem with current science is we don't know what we don't know because negative results are not published. So we encourage to do this, and in fact, that uh, study I just shared, this meta-meta-analysis stuff, that's actually registered report at the BMC Biology, and it's uh, soon to be come out from that journal. Another way, it's not, uh, so we can actually change some of the culture 
So this is the idea we came up with the, some workshop a couple of years ago is, can we do the, you know, uh, literature synthesis like meta-analysis? What happens is those people, many of you, including myself, is, you know, we are all empiricists, um, some of the theorists, and we are collecting data. Some of those efforts translate into the publication, but some of them don't publish, yeah? And the synthesis, some of you might be the, you know, the, they might be the uh, empiricists, but the, they could be different people. They are like putting all this published work together. So what sort of like uh, synthesizes are uh, clearly biased because those non-significant results, some of the effort is not captured. So we sort of in the future, that should change. And what we um, propose is open synthesis community where Everybody should be. So if you are working on a certain topic, let's say, I don't know, sexual selection, that's the behavioral ecology topic I have worked on. Uh, that was my PhD topic as well. We should put sort of like a group, uh, you know, network of this. And all the people, regardless of the publisher in a primary research, that's they aim to do anyway. But they all be or author or contributor of the synthesis because even they don't publish the synthesis will be published all together. So that's what we call open synthesis community. I'm waiting for Grant to support this idea. So, you know, watch this space, I guess. So, um, so it's interesting stuff in psychology. I started with, I mean, nearly finishing fast part, started off with this reproducibility crisis. In psychology, they don't, they try not to call this anymore because crisis sounds too serious and we have too many crises anyway. Yeah, they want to call it the re credibility revolution because, you know, once you identify the problem, there's the problems, we can fix it. That's the opportunity, isn't it? They sometimes call it the, the, something opportunity, opportunistic like moments or something like this, credibility revolution. So we need to uh, make credi credibility revolution happen in ecology and evolution. To that end, a couple of years ago, uh, my colleague and myself created new society and uh, especially young ecologists and evolutional biologists, I want you to join. It's free or just $10, even like I think senior people, it's $20. They do, do conference, they do a lot of workshops to support and there's lots of uh, resources available. So, you know, the, um, I guess conclusion of first uh, part of my talk is, you know, join the credibility, credibility. And I said, how hard is it to say this? Credibility revolution to change the way we do science, yeah? Ecology and evolution. So leaving that first part, and second one is a little bit more uplifting, hopefully, the future of meta-analysis in ecology and evolution. I'd like to acknowledge my colleague at the UNSW, uh, Will Conwell, plant biologist, actually, that, and um, Colleague Callahan, he was a PhD student at the UNSW, now moved to University of Florida. And it's really interesting like working with him because he really sort of like uh, created this new field of using citizen science to answer many different questions. I was very lucky to work with him. So I want to uh, share a little bit of story working with Corey and some other work as well. So citizen science, is changing the way we collect a biodiversity data. And many of you have probably used it if you are not, you know, if you are ecologist and biodiversity person. So global uh, biodiversity information facility, often called GBIF, is a metadata basis. Many different nodes. Australia, we have a, a living, uh, atlas of living Australia. We've been working with them as well. They have a, multiple regional nodes, and the, every day they're getting millions of data, yeah? So this is a huge opportunity to utilize this data as a biologist or ecologist. And one of those nodes uh, across the world, it's called eBird. eBird, you can go off to do the bird watching, yeah? So even our children can contribute. So bird watching, that's not my child, but uh, this is a mobile app. You can get those in uh, one of your phone and uh, you can go out and bird watching. And this is what uh, checklist, oh, sorry, sorry. checklist looks like. And this is the important one and come back to it. Remembering this checklist is quite important. 
So what it is is like, ah, uh, you can put the, how many people are there, what's the you know effort time, how much you coverage, mileage, and you can put like you know seven different species. It's the important thing is you are putting all the how many of each species you have seen. Okay, this is a checklist, yeah, and millions of people are doing it. So. For an example, we used eBird to estimate, ask the question, how many birds in this world? Answer is actually 50 billion birds. So seven, a little bit more than seven birds per person. Eh? And how did we do this? Uh, using the eBird data across the world and also combining with all census more reliable, we assume those are true birds estimate census bird data, and we used uh, some imputation technique based on the, you know, how easy to detect color, flock size, body size, IUCN status. And uh, this study is like you know, 50 million birds with large confidence interval, but what we have achieved is we have estimated number of individual per each species, 9,700 of them. Yeah? So that's kind of amazing what you can do with this citizen science data. You know, that was not possible, let's say, even five years ago. But you were kind of thinking, oh, that's, that's, that's not meta-analysis, that's just a big data analysis. So I'm going to tell you about our sort of biggest meta-analysis I ever done or world has ever done using eBird data. But before that, I need to tell you about, so this is a theoretical, supposed to be theoretical work. It's going to be just I'm talking about meta-science stuff. But in, um, you may have or may not have heard of, it's a bit like a second law of thermodynamics, which everybody knows, but the second law of macroecology, nobody probably knows, I mean, apart from ecologists. So that's called the abundance-occupancy relationship. What it is, is how widespread of species, those are data from this paper, and it does, I think this is a fish species. And the abundance, so what it says, widely distributed species are more abundant per unit space. I don't know, this seems like a count, um, intuitive or counterintuitive, I don't know. But this relationship is so robust, that's why it's called second law of thermodynamics, not thermodynamics, macroecology. They used it in a conservation because if there are species widespread, you don't need to worry about that particular species. Or fish quota, it's clever, no? This fish, species of fish widespread, you can just harvest a lot more. And this is taken very seriously. That's very theoretical. Havel's very famous uh, unified uh, neutral theory of ecology predicts this relationship. That's why it's taken seriously. Of course, there has been meta-analysis on this already quite a while ago. They put like uh, 300, nearly 300 data points together. This is called um, funnel plots, and what it's showing is this is zeta is a, basically the transformation correlation. Let's say correlation of 0.6. That's it's actually correlation of 0.6. This correlation and those are like just one data point. They're putting all those available correlation and taking a mean of it. So overall mean, metanalytic mean of this abundance occupancy relationship at 0.6. That's by far the largest or biggest relationship, or how do I say, largest relationship I've ever seen in ecology and ev evolution of biology. I mean, this is why it's probably called the second law. No? This is so strong and supported by empirical evidence. However, yeah, there's a disregarded hypothesis. The easiest explanation of the second law of uh, macroecology is a sampling bias. Widespread species is easier to see. So if you are surveying a unit space, widespread species, you're gonna find it first. Yeah? Other sort of rare one is like maybe densely populated in one area or something. So this relationship would disappear if you observe units like a space, like really extensively, this relationship would disappear. But this has been disregarded because meta-analysis, lots of you know, published work, supports the like second law. But uh, we talked about publication bias. What if there's a publication bias? Whole ecological literature is tainted with publication bias. So now it comes the eBird data, because eBird, when people are going out to the uh, bird watching, they are not worrying about publication bias. Yeah? They just want to go and see what's bad. So I'm going to use eBird data to quantify 
to see whether this second law of macroecology would fall, uh, hold. Okay, how did we do that? So based on nearly 8,000 species, let's say, those are, so you remember, I asked you to remember the checklist. So you go out here, you go out, uh, um, you know, bird watching, you'll be doing a, your checking list, you're putting what species you saw, how many you saw it. So those are all the checking lists we collected from the eBirds. This is in the US, this is in some in Europe. Here's uh, uh, Australia. It looks like Melbourne, but let's say Sydney. This is the, maybe the core is collecting, going out, bee eaters. He saw 10 bee eaters. So you can see each checklist you put in eBird, we get this local abundance, yeah? So beta was 10, other species are 20. So we watched about 20 different species. And range size we know from GBIF data. Each 8,000 species, or near close to 8,000, we know that data. So we can calculate correlation for each checklist. So EBAD checklist, we calculate correlation, turn into zeta. Basically, this is just a transformation, so make it easy to... Uh, do the statistics, and then we turn, and n is the number of species. He has 20, he has about 10. You know, some, some people just go out in one, um, you know, the bird watching trip, they can watch about 200, yeah? It's a good day for the bird watchers. And we can put all this together, meta-analysis to, you know, putting all the effect size together. And if you put together, it should look like this precision is higher precision means it's based on lots of, number of bird species and uh, you know, lower precision. You know, uh, it's not many species you have seen, so there's a lots of error in this, but as you, your list grows, this should converge to true effect size. And what we are expecting is 0 0.6, correlation of 0 0.6. That was you know, uh, estimated by earlier meta-analysis. But what did we get? So we're gonna share the, our, meta-analysis using eBirds. Is it so far okay? This makes sense. So checklist, we calculate correlation each because we know the local abundance from checklist and we know the range size from GBIF data. That's okay. So, and this is a result and I take you through, I mean, it's, you can see it's a bang on zero, yes? And here's probably like a precision, it's hard to say, but this is the uh, list having like, you know, 200 species around here are just only 10 species. If you are just 10 species, sampling error make it like any type of correlation, but it's, as sample size increases, it converges. We were expecting correlation or zeta about 0 0.65, but it's actually bang on zero. And it's based on 17 million effect sizes. So that's why I claim this is the biggest meta-analysis and actually based on three billion observation of individual births. And the overall effect size 0 0.15, since I have a lots of data set, it turns out to be this is like a positively significant. Are we supporting this second law? Not at all, I get to this, you know. You know as you know, sample size a lot, and anything can be statistically significant. He has meaningless. But what's most important or interesting observation, which supports, it's actually it's this, we can nullify this second law of macroecology. It's this number, I squared. I squared is a proportion of like actual true variability because you would expect this is all across the world. Maybe those relationships between, differ between Japan and Europe and Australia, but the almost like 86.0% of variation you see in this figure is actually sampling variance, a difference in the sample sizes. And this is the smallest I square I have ever observed in the meta-analysis. So this tells me actually this second, you know, abundance occupancy relationship was statistical artifacts, even though this is in the textbook. And uh, you might uh, remember originally meta-analysis. Meta-analysis they found the correlation of 0 0.6. They said the fail safe number indicates, so some sort of publication sort of bias test indicated that more than half million unpublished null results would be required to nullify their results. But you know, it's okay because we have a 17 million, not just, you know, half a million. Eh? So that's quite surprising, yeah? 
Uh, there's another one. So I said it's actually 0 0.015 or significant. So it's a bit hard to see because it's 17 million data points there. But here, log effort time. So one log effort time is about three minutes. And uh, five log effort time is about three hours. And you can, as you can see, you, you can't really see. But uh, you, know, you need to believe me. Actually, when you are putting uh, less effort, it supports sampling bias hypothesis. You get positive relationships if you are not putting uh, much effort. That's the second law of macroecology. But if you watch about three hours, this completely disappears. So this 0 0.015 significant results becomes like bang on zero, not significant, if you uh, correct for effort time. OK. So time-wise, I'm OK. OK. So future meta-analysis, promised future meta-analysis. So I think meta-analysis, if you have done it, or maybe you haven't done it, but you have read it, those meta-analysis you see is usually literature-based one, but we can go beyond literature-based meta-analysis. You can use archive, archived raw data. Actually, this is becoming like, a, um, I think, standard in medicine. They call it the individual patient uh, participant data meta-analysis. Anyway, citizen science data, we have shown you the example how to use, and uh, you, know, you can use this in a meta-analytic framework. And also, you can uh, incorporate climatic data into meta-analysis. So example I want to show, uh, share is, it's sort of like you know, a suitable example here, because Onna village is the village of coral. So I want to have done the, some meta-analysis coral disease prevalence over year and the temperature. So this is an example of the data integration I'm advocating. So you, you hear about you know, the coral bleaching being a really serious problem, but neglected is actually they've been um, infested with those different all sorts of disease. And uh, we've done meta-analysis around based on 300 uh, papers. And as you can, you kind of can see over the years, yeah, prevalence, this proportion of disease uh, corals increasing, yeah? And those are three different oceans, Atlantic, Indiana, Pacific Oceans, it's increasing. That was you collected from the original data, 300 different studies. But uh, you, know, you can use those you know, online, all those climatic data available, so you can um, actually get all those average summer sea surface temperature on that particular spot, and you can just do the meta-analytic analysis there. And you can see not only here, you know, predicts the prevalence, but also higher temperature predicts disease. And we done the, some uh, prediction as well. Bad news is by 2,100, half of coral disease and you know, corals disease or something. It's it's bad news, but you know we can change something still while away the 2,100. But this is what I call data integration. It's not just you know literature-based data, but we can put all sorts of data together to do meta-analysis. That's the future of meta-analysis. Ah, so big data, you know, what about the big data? You know, we've done some big data meta-analysis, uh, and, you know, I talk to my computer science colleagues, and they say, like, oh, Shinichi, you know, meta-analysis, this is going to be obsolete because we're just going to do big data analysis, and that's going to be mainstream. And I actually disagree with that opinion like, like them. So Michael Chang, Dana Jack, they are two meta-analysts, meta-analysts, I guess. And they propose this kind of idea I've been also thinking is the split analyze, meta-analyze approach. And basically, big data is too big, and it has a structure. So you can actually split data into different data chunk. Maybe it's a year, it's a place, it's a trait, it's a different, you know, it's so heterogeneous then each of the data set, you can actually calculate the effect size, yeah? And you can use a meta-analytic method to put together effect size. By doing so, you can actually use all the cool statistical tools people have been developing meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is a big field. So actually lots of med medical statistician working on it, social science statistician working on it. So there's a very rich tools we can use. And it's suddenly big data doesn't, big, doesn't feel like a big data anymore because we are chunking into the effect size. And we can actually do the, some analysis which people can understand, or ecologists understand, yeah? So I wanna share that I'm nearly finishing my talk. 
I want to share a couple of uh, examples of this split analyze, meta analyze approach from our lab. This is second, um, second final slide, I think. So amazingly, yes, like it's data everywhere these days, yeah? Because, uh, you know, this in international mass phenotyping consortium, all data online, you've never heard of it, but it's over 500 <laughs> traits, crazy, and the 100,000 mice, it's increasing counting across 12 institutions in the, like, you know, maybe Japan's included, the US, Europe, so you can actually just download all those data and you can ask any questions you like. We, we are evolutional biologists, so we want to ask the evolutionary questions. One of the questions asks, so actually the original paper I saw was using this data, you know, the sexual dimorphism, males and females and mice are different, but what trait, which trait, how many traits they're different? Yeah, that was a nature communication paper I saw. And I thought like, oh, this is cool. I can't, but, what I want to know is not the mean difference. I wanted to know, oh, yeah, sexual dimorphism in trait variability. So this is data set so vast, you can actually for many traits, 500 traits, you can imagine there's a male distribution, female distribution. We are inter interested, evolutional biologists were interested in the variability of the traits. So we compared, is there sexual dimorphism? what difference is between male and female trait in the distribution with it, not the mean. So that was this paper in eLife, and using exactly the same data set, we recently published in this uh, one, and uh, we looked at, um, so it's interesting, the, you know, their distribution's quite different. How about the allometric relationship between male and females? And it turns out to be, very few people have looked at the difference in the allometry. You are wondering what is allometry and why is that important? And actually, it becomes quite important in the drug sort of dosage stuff because the, um, how do I explain? Most of actually allometric study or dosage, drug dosage based on male allometry because they only study male mice or male human subjects. So if male and female arometric relationship between weight and metabolic, you know, their metabolic capacity is different. If you are using male arometric slope to adjust your drug uh, dosage, you get it wrong. You may be overdosing female, you know, uh, maybe underdosing female. And there's certainly example for this, yeah? But uh, our con that is already, you know, our contribution is using so using most, I forgot most, we used this split analyze, meta-analyze, because you can split by trait. So 500 different traits, we can calculate male and female effect size, compare them, analyze in a meta-analytic framework, and we can understand the male-female difference. And it's probably most uh, systematic and the largest study comparing male-female arometric differences. Okay, the last take home message slides is the ecological and evolutional studies are just a little bit uh, like vastly underpowered. So we need to change something. We need to collaborate more. We need to do more meta-analysis. You know, we need to increase sample size. There's lots of ideas there, but we need also credibility revolution, credibility revolution, yes. And uh, so we managed to nullify or disregard, I don't know, it get, may get challenged, yeah? It's just one study, but I uh, nullified or uh, disproved second law macroecology. So maybe this was, I think, largely due to publication bias. And then maybe our knowledge is shaped by publication bias. But we need more study to sort of looking into the effects of publication bias. I think there's a great future combining different types of data, data integration, meta-analysis being one. Also, meta-analysts have a critical role to play in the era of big data. And there's so much data, we are getting into theory poor data rich era. So this program like, you know, science, uh, theories, <laughs> hmm? um, theory sort of like, you know, focused, visiting program and OIST is like hugely welcome. 
And the meta-analysis can actually generate lots of new theories as well, which I'm gonna work on here at OIST, I think. And also, moral of this talk is everybody should, do be, should be doing a meta-analysis. So I'd like to thank future meta-analysis for listening and my talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, lots of food for talk. <laughs> um, please, your yeah, questions are welcome. Please use the microphones on the tables for asking questions so people in Zoom can listen. Any question? Dave? Hi, so I just um, really interested, I use eBird a lot. I'm an avid user, but I'm also a terrible user of eBird in that I'll go out and I'll just randomly, you know, add the warblers that I see and ignore everything else. Uh, so how, how do you deal with, that's kind of like a form of publication bias, right? And like people going out and ignoring a lot of birds. How do you deal with that in your study? So Dave, so the short answer is we didn't. And we assumed, I guess, the EBAD represents the presence absence data. And most of like, you know, citizen science data, people, you know, as you have pointed out, if it's just a presence data, it's not as useful, useful as presence absence data. So this, we have to um, you know, seriously address this, but I think Corey has worked on this and uh, um, I can't sort of uh, you know, uh, remember off the top of my head, but uh, certainly there's uh, some um, like, work addressing at this point. But it is, I mean, you know, our, you know, our publications bias, also citizen science has this bias as well, because lots of people will just write down, oh, kingfisher, this is so cool. I'm just going to put that in the, you know, so maybe rare species are sort of like, you know, has more, you know, the overestimated. We certainly agree with that. But there's a, certainly there's a, you know, all those presence, absence, and uh, observe, how do you call it? The easy to observe factor can be controlled for. That's what we try to do when we did that this uh, estimated, like, you know, the older bird species, how many individual, we try to control all those factors. I mean, certainly, I mean, like, you know, you might, you know, you might, if you see the data, our paper, it's a huge confidence interval. And you know, there was a lot of criticism. There was comments like, oh, this is so useless because confidence interval is massive. You are not estimating anything. But we, we say this is the, you know, this is the start, isn't it? Because those data will be getting robust. Those issues will be sorted in the future. Maybe we can, you know, machine learning could you know, correct some of the human behavior biases. So I think it's a fast step. You know, I certainly say this, I told 50 billion birds in the uh, world, this is probably wrong, right? But the confidence interval is so big, I think a true number will be in that region, yes? Yeah. Sorry, I haven't really answered your question, but yeah, I dodged quite well, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Shy. I can ask one. So I'm curious about the, what's uh, under the hood. So, for example, for this uh, first part on publication bias, yeah. how do you estimate the impact on publication bias? On yeah, 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 yeah. So that's idea. okay. So oh, I had actually slide, but I deleted this. Is the so this so actually like a estimation of like a true publication bias? We need a sort of model called selection model. And that's quite difficult to implement, but there's a very clever regression-based, simple, simple one. Yeah, maybe I can use the, uh, yeah, the chalk. No, so <laughs> I tried to explain that there's a... Uh, the chalk? Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Oh, yes, yes. Maybe I tried to... So that's, here's the effect size, here's zero, and uh, what is this, the standard error or some sort of error, or sampling error, isn't it? sampling error. And publication bias happens uh, if you, you know, the, let's, let's say the relationship zeros here, 
And if publication bias happens, what happens is that larger effect size have a larger standard error. So crowd of data is like this. If there's no publication bias, crowd is like this, yeah? That, that, that's good. Sampling error, effect size. And um, actually, um, so this regression line at the zero, so data points is here. The very clever, like simple method is we assume 10 sampling errors zero, that's uh, infinite sample size. We assume this is actually true because if you met, conduct meta-analysis on this crowd, you are estimating effect size overestimating here. But when you assume this regression, it's a little bit more complicated this. I mean, I just uh, uh, sum, uh, simplifying this method. It's very clever, simple method. So actually you can take this regression line, 10 sampling errors, zero. This is a true effect size. So this is how you actually estimate. So original effect size is overestimated. You correct for it. So when I said bias correction, I use this method. And uh, you know, publication bias, any method is, we don't know the, like how much publication bias there is. So we need to take some, um, you know, we make lots of assumptions, but this, this method is really simple and empirically like supported quite a lot. There was a um, nature human behavior paper, which actually looked at the difference between the meta-analysis. So let's say like, you know, 30 different topics in psychology, there was a huge replication effort of 30 different topics and a meta-analysis of the corresponding topics. And uh, sure enough, meta-analysis always overestimate effect size, yeah? So this pub, you know, replication effort will be always have a smaller sample size, almost always. By using this method, they 90% recovered actually very similar effect size to this uh, replication effort. So empirical evidence for this method is like quite good. Other questions? I have a question. So you're promoting registered reports. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, as far as I understand, you are laying off your ideas and asking other people to peer review them. Mm -hmm. So is there any mechanisms that prevent like, reviewers from stealing your oh, experiment so... design and yeah, yeah. themselves? This is a great question. And um, I think like when I was a PhD student or like early in a career, I'd be kind of paranoid for no reason. But I think probability of this happening is very small. It did happen in like, I've been in this business for 17 years. It's only happened once. Um, but I think the benefit, so I'm not saying this won't happen. But I think that, you know, the, the scooping or stealing idea, I mean, it's very rare. And actually putting, you know, you are registered report once reviewed or before, review, yeah, before being reviewed, you can put in an Echoeva archive. Actually, people thought putting a pre, pre print, you know, they will be scooped. That it's a completely opposite. You're putting precedent onto the public arena. So it's less likely people are still motivated. Like if they are already doing it, they should continue doing it. But you know, when they see the preprints of the registration, you can actually preprint the first stage one, just the intra uh, meso bioarchive doesn't accept it, but the us echo web archive does accept this. And if once there, Actually, what would happen is two things. Like, you know, people look at it and, oh, I had a similar idea, but, you know, I don't bother doing that. Or, oh, this is so cool. I want to collaborate with you. And then you get some collaborator contacting. That has happened nearly 10 times in my career. So if I'm doing, like, you know, I actually email, not the preprint, but I email lots of people. I'm doing this uh, meta-analysis. I need some, you know, unpublished data. And, you know, people, I contact people and then, you know, there's an opportunity. I've been collecting similar data. Can we do it together? And we can do it together. 
So I think it's more positive. I, you know, I've shown that like the power of each study is so low. We have to change the way do, we need to do science, I think. Problem is, who's gonna get credit, you know? You know, that's not the all roses, the sort of collaboration that's like, it's nice and cuddly, but the, you know, the, some problem remains. I don't have an answer for this. Who gets credit or, you know, what's the first author, last author, is this meaningful? Actually, actually very, I recently, uh, so Food for Thought is, uh, we publish, you know, credit, how, you know the credit system? Yeah, so who did what? You, you are starting to use credit. We are proposing a new method called merit. And that will be published in Nature Communications soon. So that's maybe answer some of this, um, how do I say, the credit, credit or acknowledgement or who, who gets credit kind of issue, who gets credit some merit, yeah. What does merit stand for? But I leave it there. there. <laughs> Any other questions? Tom? Thank you for your exciting talk. Um, you, you just mentioned about the small effect sizes, and uh, I, I was just wondering, like, do you have any intuitions of why the effect sizes are so small? Are we asking the wrong questions, or or is the field just so advanced that all the big effect sizes are already done, or what's going on there? It, it's excellent questions, and uh, like short answer is, I believe that's what's happened. What Lata is like actually, we are not asking. Uh, uh, wrong question. We are asking more sophisticated question. And the very good example is a GWA stuff. Eh? So all the genetic uh, genes of large effects being identified. And we all agree. And what GWA studies are identifying is a smaller effect, but nonetheless very important. And that's probably happening across this all the sciences. Indeed, there is a very interesting paper in a Giga Science, which I reviewed and published a few years ago, is they looked I got the, you know, using all those sort of like, you know, scraping from the, all the, you know, web and it looked at, the, I think, PubMed, all the data and whether effect size are going down across the year. And indeed, effect size of main findings going down. And I wouldn't say this is looking at the wrong question, but I think what we are interested in the most sophisticated, detailed, even though it's important, because it's, let, let's be sort of think about, rationally or rationally here. I think if its effect is so large, we all know it. And the folklore should contain this knowledge. If this is so obvious, you know, some psychology one, you know, power pose and all those sort of like, you know, all effects are there. Yeah, those, if they, like, you know, all the people would have figured out. So most of um, effects we are after is actually small, but doesn't necessarily mean that's not important. It, it kind of uh, feels consistent with the recent um, news about uh, um, that breakthroughs are happening less and less frequently. Science, uh, yes. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think I think that's kind of make it more exciting. It's you know getting a bit harder, but you know there's a, certainly that opportunity. I mean, publication by a huge effect. You know, I'm finding large effects there. And it's not like really the true scientific effects, but there is a certain opportunity. And I wouldn't disregard there's a, something really exciting is waiting to happen, like, you know, maybe disregarding second law, you know, <laughs> macroecology. That's pretty big, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, do you want to ask one quick question? Because your time is up. Okay. So, yeah, maybe back to the pretty digital report. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if, so that kind of pretty digital report can work for the hypothesis testing work, or if you want to work more like a generally just observing behavior of this species and want to get some variable data, even in that case, if that works, so that is kind of special. Yeah, yeah, so this is a fairly um, common question I get, and my answer, quick answer is yes, it would work for the uh, conformational studies, observational studies, because I think, you know, Maybe like a narrow meaning of registered reports, you have to put like clear hypothesis. But I think, you know, the registered report or pre-registration could work with just putting, you know, your aims, you know, what do you want to do and load it up. And uh, um, it's still not many people does this and not many people do this, but our lab, like almost everybody, 
regardless whether experimental or not, we do the registration and put the aims. And also I'm thinking like, you know, this is a lot of work and you need to know a lot of stuff because you have to write the intra method. You know, you need to know quite a lot about like statistical analysis beforehand. So I'm, there's another project I haven't done it, but if I will do it, if I get the grant is modular uh, registration. So you can, mod, like, you can probably split into the, those registration into three, hypothesis or aim registration and uh, study design, you know, registration and the statistical analysis registration. Because at the moment, I think the bar is so hard, high to do this kind of stuff. So we want to create modular registration to really encourage, including those observational work. Yeah. Because, you know, you have an aim, yeah? yeah? I like that idea. So kind of related for our question, but do you think if everybody using this type of method, do you think the number of publication increase or decrease? Uh, this, this is a good question. I mean, like, you know, number of publications always increasing, so. <laughs> per, per person, I would say. Yeah. Uh, per person, per researcher. Yeah, I think it's a welcome thing because, as I said, my guesstimate is half of PhD thesis never published, even not in the uh, preprint server. And that's a huge waste. Yeah, I have a see, shown is the most shocking case of publication bias today. And that gets in, and this is not the first sort of example of ecology and evolution, and there's a more to be found out. And I think, you know, it's, it's welcome. If everybody has a more publication, that's good. They're contributing. They publish all their negative results. It's a lot of more work, less incentive. We need to change some incentive structure. That's another talk, I guess. That, but, um, yeah, I think that, that's, I mean, increase, that's, that's, it's kind of good. CV looks good, yes. <laughs> so our time is up. So yeah. let's uh, thank Shinichi again. around for a while so if you have other questions just knock at this door <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Thank you.